it's Scott, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the two to four player game, Back to the Future, Dice Through Time, designed by Chris Leader, Ken Franklin, and Kevin Rogers, and published by Ravensburger, who helped sponsor this video. Just like in the classic movies, the bully Biff Tannen has taken the DeLorean for a joyride through time, stealing things and just causing general havoc to the space-time continuum. In order to repair all of his damage, you're going to need to complete key events from the Back to the Future trilogy in order to find and return those stolen items. So fire up the flux capacitor, join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, place the board in the center of the play area. Then shuffle the event cards which have this back and put them on the indicated space of the board here, setting this out of time marker on the start space of the out of time track. These are the item cards and each has a year printed on the back. Separate them by the years and then shuffle each pile individually. You'll then choose the same number of items from each year depending on the difficulty level you want. For a standard game like we'll set up here, put three items per year face down onto their matching spaces of the board. For a more challenging game, you could use four items each or even all five. And for a less challenging game, use only two items per year. Either way, when you're done, return any remaining item cards to the box without looking at them. Now shuffle these double-sided Einstein tokens and put them face down in a supply next to the board, and then set these Paradox tokens nearby as well. Now put a Biff standee on the matching colored Biff start space, as indicated on the board by this icon. Each player now takes one of these play mats, and we'll set up a two-player game with blue and brown, returning the others to the box. Each player then takes the four dice in their color along with the matching DeLorean, which they then place on the clock tower space of the timeline that matches their DeLorean's color. Finally, we're told to give this first player marker to whoever has traveled through time the furthest. In other words, give it to the oldest player. And that's the setup. In Back to the Future Dice Through Time, you and the other players will be working together to complete key events from the movies, find items that Biff stole, and return them to their place in the timeline. But interfering in the space-time continuum tends to cause problems, and if you create too many paradoxes, you'll find yourself out of time. The game is played over a series of rounds, and each is made up of six steps, starting with drawing and placing event cards. To do this, the first player draws a number of event cards based on the number of players. In a two-player game, draw three event cards. Draw five in a three-player game, and eight with four players. But either way, set the drawn cards aside face down. And if you ever run out of events while playing, shuffle any discarded event cards into a new event deck. You'll reveal and resolve the drawn cards one at a time, but I'm just going to flip all of them over here so you can see them. There are two main kinds of events. Special events, which have a yellow frame around their text at the bottom, and location events, which will show you a location and a year at the bottom. Some special events happen immediately, and after you resolve them, you put them into an event discard pile, while others will last for the entire round. Those you just set nearby to remind you of their ongoing effect. And then they're discarded at the end of the round. These location events have a location and year at the bottom. And when you draw one, you then place it on the location in the matching year, which will also share its color. Now, if that card also has this Biff icon in the corner, then you move the Biff standee for that year to that location. And keep in mind, it's possible over the course of the game for a location to contain more than one event. The event deck contains three cards of each location. Next, we have the roll dice step, but before this, players may choose to reclaim any of their dice that are already on the board. And we'll see how your dice can end up on the board a little bit later. Now all the players roll their dice simultaneously, and then they take turns performing their actions, starting with the first player and going clockwise once around the table. On your turn, you'll perform all of the dice actions that you wish to, and after you've fully completed them, the next player takes their turn. And this will continue again until everyone has gone once. Each of the six different die faces represent a different type of action. And to take an action, you first choose one of the dice that you rolled, and you put it on your player mat to show that it's spent. Then you perform the action of that symbol, and you'll notice your player mat has a reminder of all the actions that you can take on your turn. But let's go through each one of these right now. 
Using a lightning symbol will let you re-roll any number of your unused dice to maybe help you get a symbol for an action that you didn't get on your first roll. As well, if you ever have two matching symbols like I have here, you can spend these to activate an effect called Mr. Fusion. As shown here on your player map, that allows you to treat that pair of symbols as any other type of action symbol. This symbol represents Doc Brown, and spending it allows you to remove up to two Paradox tokens from anywhere on the board. It doesn't matter where your DeLorean is, just pick up any two Paradoxes and return them to the supply. Now you might be asking, Rodney, what are our Paradox tokens? How do they get on the board? What are you even talking about? Why did your shirt change? Don't worry, time travel's complicated, but we'll see how Paradox tokens get on the board a little bit later. If you have an arrow, you can use it to move your DeLorean to any location within the current year. For example, this player at the clock tower could spend an arrow symbol to move to Hill Valley High School. But you also have the option of spending any one single die, no matter what symbol it shows, in order to move one space left or right within your current year. If you spend a die with this flux capacitor symbol, you can travel through time. This action lets you move up or down within the same column to any other year. So for example, I could move my DeLorean from 1955 here at Lou's Cafe down to Cafe 80s in 2015. Or if I'd wanted, I could have gone to the saloon in 1885. Moving through space and time is not without risk though. If your DeLorean ever moves into a space with another DeLorean, you must immediately move the out of time marker two spaces to the right. As we'll see later, this is bad, but this only happens when you first move into a space with another player. In other words, you don't automatically move the out of time marker again at the start of this player's turn just because you're both now together. Now just keep in mind, if you're using one of these arrow symbols to move from one location directly to another one, you do not suffer an out of time penalty if you passed over other DeLoreans. The same is true when you use a flux capacitor to pass over a DeLorean on another timeline. Again, you don't suffer an out of time penalty there either. By moving, you'll be able to get to locations with events on them, and then by completing those events, you'll be able to recover items that Biff stole. To complete an event at your location, you must spend dice with symbols that match what is showing here in the upper left hand corner of that event. Here I need to spend an arrow and a wrench, like I have on these two dice. However, if you have two dice showing the same symbol, you can spend them as any symbol needed when completing an event. So this combination of dice would work as well. Another option you have is the wrench symbol. This can always be used as any other symbol that you need during an event, but only for completing events. So again, here we have another combination of dice that would work. Just keep in mind, you cannot complete an event as long as Biff is on that location you'd first have to move him out of the way, and you can do that with a separate action by spending a die with a fist. This lets you move Biff to any other location within the same year. So if you and Biff were both here at Doc's lab and you spent a fist symbol, you could move him perhaps over to Marty's house. If there are multiple events on a single location, you must complete them all together, spending dice that match their combined symbols. Then after completing all the events at the location, you remove them and put them into the event discard pile. You also remove any Paradox tokens from that location, returning them to the supply as well. But again, we'll see how Paradoxes get added to the board a little bit later. Now with all the events cleared from the space, no matter how many you removed, you then draw and reveal one item card from the deck of your current year and place it below your mat. Gaining items is essential to winning, but you can only hold, at most, two items at a time. This means if you clear a location of events while you're holding two items, you don't draw another. And if the item deck for a year is empty, you also won't draw an item after clearing events. Though you'll see later why you might want to complete events even if that year has no items left to collect. Once you have items, you need to return them to their correct location within the right timeline. And if you're ever on one of those locations, and there are no incomplete events or Biff standees there, then you can remove this item and put it back in the box. That part of the timeline has now been restored. Now there is one special case that I want to make extra clear. If you're already holding two items, and you're trying to return one of them to a location that has an event there, well let's say you do successfully clear this event. After the event is cleared, 
you would then get to draw an item. However, you have no room, so you won't get to draw an item, even though you are now going to be returning this item to its correct location. The order always follows these steps. Resolve the event first, gain a new item if you can, and then return the item you are holding to its place in the timeline, putting it back in the box. Now there are a couple of other benefits you immediately gain after you return an item to the timeline and back to the box. First, you move the edit time marker one space to the left if you're able. Then take and reveal one of these Einstein tokens, putting it face up on this area of the board. These tokens represent dice symbols that any player can spend on their turn to perform the related action or help complete an event. Once one of these tokens is used, just return it to the box. As rounds pass, more events will be added to the board, sometimes stacking up on one location, making it harder to get enough symbols on the dice to clear them all. Because remember, to remove events from a single spot, you must clear them all in a single action. You can't just remove one card at a time. Now to make this easier, you can help your fellow players by interfering with the timeline, which I'm sure is safe. The technique is called rippling dice. During your turn, this allows you to place any of your unspent dice onto your current location without changing the symbols they show. Then on a future turn, anyone at that location or on the same location in a future year can spend those rippled dice as if they were their own, returning them to their original owner's mat. In other words, if this player was here, here, or here, then on their turn they could use these dice. Now if a player was on the schoolhouse in 1885, they would not be able to use the rippled dice because this location is in the past before the dice got left behind. Which is how you'd expect time travel to work, right? With that, we now know all of the things that you can do on your turn, and after you've completed all the actions on your turn that you can or wish to, play passes to your left and will continue this way until each player has taken their turn. You then move on to the next step of the round, advancing the out of time marker. Look at the board to see which of the four timelines has the most locations covered by events. But keep in mind you're counting the number of locations with events on them, not the number of individual event cards. In this case, the timeline with the most locations that contain events is the very bottom one here, 2015. But if there's a tie between years, like we would have in this case, you pick the year earliest in the timeline. So now this is the one we would focus on. With the year selected, you now add the number of locations that have events to the number of paradox tokens within that timeline, and then move the out of time marker that number of spaces. So in this case, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now if this marker ever reaches the final spot, titled Game Over, then the players are erased from existence and immediately lose the game. However, assuming that didn't just happen, you'll move to the next step of the round, adding paradox tokens. So finally, we're going to learn where these things come from. In this step, you go back to the timeline that just advanced the out of time marker and add one paradox token to each location that has an event on it, but do not add one to locations that already have one of these paradox tokens. A location can only ever have a single token on it at a time. So in a case like this, we wouldn't add any new tokens. But let's say this location did have an event as well. It doesn't already have a token, so now it would get one. And remember, to get rid of these paradox tokens, you just have to resolve the events at that location. Once they're resolved, the paradox token is also removed at the same time. Finally, you end a round by passing the first player marker to the player on the left, and then you begin a new round. To win the game, players need to complete events in order to reveal items from these decks, which they will then have to return to the correct locations. Once all of the items in all of these piles have been successfully returned to their correct locations, at that exact moment, the game ends and the players win. However, if the out of time marker ever hits the game over space, the players immediately lose. This is why it's sometimes important to resolve events within a timeline, even if there are no more items there to collect, because this can help slow down how quickly the out of time marker advances at the end of each round. And that's how you play Back to the Future Dice Through Time. If you have any questions at all about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at BoardGameGeek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. But until next time, thanks.
for watching.